Hi, and in this video, I'd like to cover my thoughts on how to approach picking an army to play in Age of Sigma and how the focus from a lot of new players asking this question when making this decision is frequently wrong. But first, little update. Uh, this, hopefully, will be the last time I'll be presenting these videos in quite this way. Tomorrow, studios are being assembled. It's a right mess in here at the moment for two reasons. One is there actually just isn't enough room in here to keep everything tidily stored, but I could do better. Indeed, it has been better. But secondly, not really much point because once the studio is assembled, which is now just hours away really, and the shelving arrives, actually that's the next day. So that's on the Tuesday. Um, I'll be spending a bit of time each day just basically grabbing boxes of stuff and taking it over there and, and tidying it up in there, hopefully. So I don't really much point in tidying up in here right now. Now, it won't actually be possible to get everything set up in the studio in the way I'll need it as such for next weekend. Apart from anything else, the electricity isn't being connected until the following week. However, I am hoping that whatever topic I decide to cover next week can be done from there. I'm hoping I can at least get it taking shape. And one of the things I want to be start doing is a series of guide videos on Age of Sigma. So it's a few games I enjoy playing and all will be featuring at some point on the channel in proportion to the amount of time I'll be spending on them. So much more Warhammer 40k Age of Sigma than say World of Warcraft. But I, I do really want to get into some Warhammer fantasy stuff out there. That's sort of my favourite. And so it might seem sensible to begin with the age old question at the start as a new player, anyone playing any form of fantasy game actually, what class, character or army is best for me? Except where people go wrong is they don't actually ask that question. What they ask is which one is best and they miss off the for me part. Now, I was checking through a Warhammer discussion forum yesterday and sure enough came across this very question. I imagine if you look for long enough, you'd see it everywhere. The question began right off the bat with wanting to win games. Now, of course, the point of any game is to, to win games. And it's also very important that people try and win games. I'm not going to say, oh, don't try, just have fun, doesn't matter. Who well, it, you do must have fun and it doesn't matter who wins in a way. But you also must try because if you don't try, no one has fun. It isn't any fun if one player doesn't try. We've, we've all seen the scenarios in any gaming context, but it's particularly the case in a tabletop game. The following two crop up quite a bit. Um, one, a player looks across at their opponent's army and just decides they're going to lose. They don't try to win. Um, they, they may or may not whinge about the perceived imbalance. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they go, oh, that's just overpowered. Oh, I can't win against that. Um, or maybe they just don't, but they don't try anyway. Maybe they don't whinge, but they don't try. It's no fun for anyone. Second, the player does try to win, but they have a shocker of a turn one or some other event doesn't quite play out as they thought it would in their head. Maybe they get a few bad dice rolls and then, and then they bemoan their bad luck throughout. I'm going to recall a story here, uh, which is absolutely classic case of this. It is from some years ago, Warhammer Fantasy Battle. And... It was when I was at a tournament and I had a Chaos Warrior army against, uh, I say Chaos Warrior army, it's a bit of a mix of all sorts of things, Slanesh army, against Dwarf player. Now this Dwarf, oh sorry, voice went there. This Dwarf player, right, he shot my, I had a Chaos Lord on Chaos Dragon and with a single bolt thrower, he killed it. Now let me explain how unlikely this was. First of all, he had to hit with the bolt thrower. And I forget that what the chances of that were. I don't think bolt throwers were brilliant. It may have been a four up. It may have been a 50-50 chance. I'm not going to work out all the things. You could try and work them out yourself. Um, but he had to hit it, first of all. Then when you roll to hit it, now in those days, the way it worked, it wasn't just one model. You had the Chaos Dragon and you had the Lord on top. So then you had to hit to see who it hit. So you had a one in six chance of hitting the Lord. If it had hit my dragon, my dragon would have lived. No problem. Injured, but, but it would have lived it hit the Chaos Lord. So already, this is now at least a 1 in 12 chance. Then, he had to roll to wound. Now, it's quite likely to wound. It's quite high strength. Um, I don't know whether it would have been hitting on twos or threes. It may have been threes, but it may have been twos. But it was still reasonably likely. But still, there was a chance of failure, and he succeeded in wounding it. And then there were various other things that had to happen. So I had... With that, I had a ward save, four up ward save, failed that. 
I also had regeneration, failed all of those. This thing does D3 wounds and I had three wounds. It did the D3 wounds. All of these things added up to a one in over 200 chance of happening. He killed the Chaos Lord. He was very lucky, very lucky. And I'm not gonna come out of this, I'm the one who bemoaned my luck. I, I would have had every, I wouldn't ever bemoan my luck. That was unlucky and lucky for him. The, the, the bemoaning luck part was later on in the game, because he was dwarfs, so I outmaneuvered him and I surrounded his iron breaker unit. I had my chaos dragon who was a bit aggrieved at losing his lord, rammed him in the back. I had a unit of chaos chosen knights ram him in the front. I had some trolls ram him in the side. I absolutely mullered him. I took a load of wounds. He had to take a break test. His break test needed like a, a five or less to succeed or something like that. In other words, he wasn't likely to succeed in it. And I'd already killed his battle standard bearer, so he wasn't getting any re-rolls from that. And he, he lost and he broke. And do you know what? He's dwarf, he's a bit stumpy. He tried to run away. I caught him, pursued him. That was the unit white. And do you know what he did? He complained about bad luck. It was like, that wasn't bad luck. That was as expected. But he, he made no comment about the fact that he killed my Chaos Lord with a one in 200 chance strike. But that's the sort of play you'll sometimes get as well. And that's no fun either. So what you really want to focus on is not an army that will win games, but an army that will allow you to be competitive. It will put you in the position where you can win games. It will also lose games. And when I say it will also lose games, what I mean is you will also lose games, no matter which army you pick. So I used to play mostly Fancy Battle a few years ago, as I've just alluded to. I also played some 40k as well. Guess which one I was most competitive in? That's right, Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Because I played it more often, so I got better. I played against better quality opposition, so I got better still. I spent more time considering my lists. I bought more models so that I could easily change my list. Whereas with the 40k, what I tended to do was go, oh, I like the look of these models. I'll do, I'll make an army with these models and I'll play with those models. Much more casual basis. And if I realized that there was, you know, something not quite right with the list, I didn't have... The, the extra models to just swap out. I'd have had to buy more models, paint them up, all the rest of it. You know, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, I attended tournaments. That made me a better player as well. Then World of Warcraft got its claws into me and I stopped. Then World of Warcraft got weak uh, and I escaped. Uh, sort of, still potter about. Um, so I returned to tabletop two or three years ago now. Uh, Fantasy Battle was gone. Age of Sigmar was in its place. So I started playing Age of Sigmar. And at the, the gaming club, there wasn't really a competitive scene there at all. Uh, the other players who were all sort of interested in it, there's not actually enough interest in it, but the ones who were sort of um, were also learning. So everyone was learning at the same time. So I lost some, I won some. You know, we were all learning together. We were all of the same skill level. Then last year I decided, right, I, I'm, I'm in it with Age of Sigma now, time to get back into 40k. Due to the pandemic, it meant I couldn't actually get a game until the new 9th edition had come out. I lost the first three or four games before I won one. And when I won that one, that was also against a returning player, not a veteran. This is important. Age of Sigma, 40K, any of the rest, they're not snakes and ladders. People talk, oh, it's a dice game. Well, it is a dice game. But that doesn't mean to say that who wins is down to chance. It absolutely isn't. You know, there's a reason why you get some players who consistently win in tournaments or place well, and others who consistently place poorly experience, effort, time, and practice. Yes, a game may hinge on a particular event, which comes down to the roll of the dice, you know, like a double turn in Age of Sigma, or the roll of a, some dice in a single fight. But if it did come down to that, then basically you put all your eggs in one basket. You designed a strategy that, that relied upon a particular event occurring, and if it didn't occur, then you lose. Well, that's your fault. Um, what, what you need to do is to base a strategy on getting average rolls over the course of a game, not all the time. You know, you will get a flurry of bad rolls, you get a flurry of good rolls, ride it. The double turn is a bitch though. <laughs> There's no justification for that. Um, which is of course why a lot of players use battalions for one or two drop armies to stack the odds in favor of them being able to choose whether they want to go first or second. But that's a topic for a future video in the not too distant future, I hope. So in terms of choosing the right army, I wouldn't ask which one will win you the most games because none of them will. 
you will win games as your skills with that army develop. Every army will give you the tools to be able to win games and no army will guarantee it. You could argue there are some armies that are more foolproof than others, where you, there's not as many special rules that you could easily forget. Um, but generally speaking, all of them can be competitive. I also wouldn't worry about which one is the current tournament meta. I mean, right now there isn't really one because there's not a lot of tournaments going on. COVID has seen to that. But even in normal times, because you're starting out and you'll be playing people in your local area, probably at a gaming club or store, not at a tournament. And there's a certain paper, rock, scissors to games like Age of Sigma. Hence, there's also the term counter meta uh, to go with meta. Every army has its weaknesses and the right army can be built in to exploit those weaknesses. But then if you load up on the strength to do that, you create gaps in your own army for a very different army to exploit. So forget about which army is competitive and focus on how you like to play. Because for example, some armies are very good at long range attacks, be they shooting or magic. Um, you could make a very powerful Sinch army that would be rubbish in close combat if it's very demon heavy. Um, you know, that wouldn't be for me. I like the magic, but I also like the close combat. And I'd be, I am, I am minded to get stuck into close combat with all haste. Uh, it's not what I want to do with a load of weedy uh, demons who actually just want to stay back. Like Carriage and Overlord, similar thing. Um, they also, not so much stay back, but they have that manoeuvrability. They can just zap around the battlefield because that's fun. Um, incredibly powerful army, but if your natural inclination like mine is, is, is not guerrilla warfare because that's what they, you know, plonk them down somewhere, shoot a load off and then the next turn zap them somewhere else. But if that strategy isn't bold enough for you, you will crack in the game and you'll play according to how you want to play and you'll rush them in to a charge that will be ill-advised and you could lose games that you would otherwise have won. By the same token, if you like being a coward and throwing out sneak attacks whilst being able to flit around the board, um, always out of reach of your opponent, you probably shouldn't play something like Fire Slayers or Clans Pestle and Skaven Tide. So what you want to do is think about the, the way you naturally like to play and get an army that suits that style of play. In terms of being competitive, that has got less to do with the army and more to do with building the list. So I'm not saying you can, you can get any army and then just build a list of certain points and it'll be fine. No, no, no. Within each army, there are units that go together, synergize very well. There are some units that are just not worth their points and there are some that are very good for their points. But that is the one that I'll be covering in a video very soon, hopefully in a couple of weeks. But until then, those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And until next time, I'll see you later.